Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Julie, and uh, thank for a wonderful organization here. Um, colleagues, um, ladies and gentlemen, friends, we are pleased to convene today uh, in this event here with uh, Bernadette from UNHCR and the other participating organizations on today's panel. They are ICRC, Article 36, Norwegian People's Aid, and the Civilian Impact Monitoring Project all to explore how we can support the efforts at the country level to take forward the EWIPA declaration to strengthen the protection of civilians in armed conflict. The use of explosive weapons in populated areas is a major cause of civilian harm in armed conflict. Nearly 94% of victims last year were civilians. Many surviving victims of explosive weapons face lifelong disabilities and grave psychological trauma. Explosive weapons also damage or destroy critical infrastructure with reverberating effects on essential services such as water, sanitation, electricity and healthcare, and the destruction of food supply chains. Even when parties claim to use explosive weapons in populated areas in compliance with international law, this still causes a pattern of devastating harm to civilians in the immediate and long term. And we are seeing this uh, go on today right now under our very own noses. Indeed, when used in populated areas, explosive weapons continue to wreak harm far beyond their targets and long after their use. As, human, as humanitarians, we continue to witness the death, injury, destruction, and displacement caused by the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. We see this in the occupied Palestinian territory, in Gaza today, in Ukraine, in Syria, and in many other places. OCHA has actively engaged on this issue since 2009. We have worked closely with states, the UN, ICRC, and civil society partners, some of whom you'll hear from on today's panel. And in an effort to better document, understand, and minimize the humanitarian impact of the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. In a milestone achievement on 18 November 2022, last year, states adopted the EWIPA political declaration, which has been endorsed by 83 states. States declared that they would ensure their armed forces adopt and implement policies and practices to avoid civilian harm, including by restricting or refraining from the use of explosive weapons in populated areas where such weapons may be expected to cause civilian harm. Implementing the declaration must mark a departure from the business as usual approach and go towards further reducing harm to civilians. The UN, including OCHA, remains fully invested in promoting the universalization of the political declaration and supporting its effective implementation. Today's event builds on side events OCHA co-convened earlier this year during the Protection of Civilians Week and the ECOSOC Humanitarian Affairs segment that focused on actions required by states to implement the political declaration with the goal of better protecting civilians and strengthening compliance with international humanitarian law. The objective of today's event is to raise greater awareness of a political declaration among the wide range of protection and other humanitarian actors who engage in or with the protection cluster. So the panel will speak to the humanitarian impact of EWIPA use as witnessed by protection actors on the ground. It will identify priority areas within the political declaration to address as well as opportunities and entry points for the protection cluster to reinforce national level implementation efforts. So it's my great pleasure now to give the floor to Bernadette UNH of UNHCR to provide some additional opening remarks. And I wish you all a very fruitful discussions. Thank you and over to you, Bernadette.
Hi, good afternoon, uh, Ramesh, and thank you very much, and uh, good morning and good evening to all. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, to co-host uh, this event and open it with, with Ramesh on behalf of UNHCR and uh, OCHA colleagues. Um, complementing on what Ramesh uh, said, uh, the world is witnessing a concerning increase in urban welfare, a trend that has devastating consequences for civilian populations, and Ramesh has given an, uh, us a few examples. Uh, in this context, the use of explosive weapons uh, in populated area further intensifies the risk of death and injury to civilians, as well as uh, the damage and destruction of civilian objects uh, and infrastructure. Uh, Ramesh, you have given a few examples, and uh, I'd like to say that uh, on the impact of uh, explosive weapons uh, and uh, the attacks uh, they, they cause on civilian populations, uh, we will hear a very... Um, uh, vibrant uh, uh, testimony from Mohanad in, in a few minutes. And I'd like to say uh, that I'm humbled that he uh, accepted to join us today and I'd like to thank him in advance. Um, while uh, multiple factors drive forced displacement, data from various conflicts strongly indicate a significant correlation between the use of explosive weapons and in populated areas and mass civilian displacements, whether internally or across borders. As stated by the High Commissioner for Refugees, Grandi, at the Security Council two days ago, forced displacement has now reached 114 million people. This as a result of persecution, conflict, uh, violence, and human rights violations uh, in, in too many countries. Alarmingly, up to two thirds of these more than 110 million people have been displaced within their own countries. It is absolutely imperative to bolster the protection of all civilians against both the direct and indirect effects of explosive weapons use. This requires to hear civilians' populations call for protection, to negotiate and to use diplomacy to prevent or stop the use of explosive weapons, and um, when this uh, use continues to strengthen partnership in response um, to, to, uh, to mitigate the impact of explosive weapons attacks. The, Ramesh, you mentioned the, the, the landmark uh, Dublin Declaration last year. Uh, we consider it a, a milestone towards strengthening the protection of civilians and respect for international humanitarian law. There is a pressing need to multiply our efforts to translate these commitments into concrete actions at global and national level, wherever and whenever possible. A coordinated approach to enhance protection and protective measures can help prevent arbitrary displacement, safeguarding the rights of victims and creating conditions conducive to solutions, both uh, for all civilians, but in particular also for those who are internally displaced and refugees. Today's side event is a demonstration of our joint commitments, but also our investments in this collective effort. I hope it will provide an opportunity to share best practices and tools and innovative approaches for translating the Dublin Declaration into tangible and measurable actions. I wish you and us all a, a very successful discussion. Thank you very much. Julie, I will come in now just to thank you, Bernadette um, and Ramesh, for your engagement and for so helpfully helping us frame the discussion today. We will now turn over to the debate. Um, as noted earlier, we are joined by five eminent speakers, um, all with a wealth of experience and insights on 
protection of civilians in armed conflict and specifically on the issue of explosive weapons in populated areas um, and the harm that they pose to civilians. The panel will bring both um, a perspective from the country and the global uh, level. In order to save time, um, we will post the speakers' um, titles and share with you their biographies in the chat. Um, and just to note, I have some pre-prepared questions for the speakers, um, but we would like also to put your questions to them as well. So please do post your questions and comments in the chat um, box and we will um, come back to them as the, as the conversation progresses. Um, and then just a note to the speakers, I'd like again to just remind you to keep your initial responses relatively short so that we can um, hear from all of you and move to questions from the floor. Our first uh, speaker today is Laura Boyer, Director of UK-based Article 36. Laura, my question to you is, um, why is curbing the use of explosive weapons urgent? And what is the significance of the AWIPA political declaration? We've heard a little bit of that from our um, intro um, opening remarks, but it would be great to hear a bit more from you. Um, as well as building on that question, now that it's been adopted um, by 83 states, as we heard from Ramesh, where do we go from here? Over to you, Laura. Thanks so much, Dina, and thanks very much to OCHA and UNHCR for organizing this event, but also for those opening remarks, which, which very much, I think, set the scene for, for the event and the discussion today. Um, so I work with INU. We are a coalition of civil society organizations. Uh, and through our work, we have found that whenever explosive weapons are used in cities, towns and populated areas, it is always civilians that suffer the most. This is something that we have documented through research and data collection, but also through the presence of our members with programs in countries that are impacted by conflict and, and explosive weapon use. So you asked Sarah about why this why this is an urgent problem. And I think in large part, it is because it is such a, a widespread and severe problem. Uh, through our data collection and research, um, we have found that each year, tens of thousands of civilians are killed and injured from bombing and shelling in towns and cities um, and other populated areas, and yet more suffer from the, the psychological impacts of living under bombing. Uh, one of our members, Action on Armed Violence, has uh, collected data that shows that when explosive weapons are used in populated areas, 90% of the victims are civilian. Um, we are seeing very much on our, our news screens uh, and, and through reports today of the extensive bombardment in the Gaza Strip and the impacts that that's having on people there, which I think is one very acute example of devastation and suffering. Um, and yet I think it's also important to recognize that this is very much a pattern of harm that has been experienced all too frequently in many different contexts as well, in Ukraine, Ethiopia, Yemen, Sudan, Syria, to name just a few examples. Um, so it's very much um, a persistent, widespread, and I think also foreseeable pattern of harm that through the, the research and data collection uh, our network has done, uh, we've documented this uh, each year in 50 to 60 countries um, to varying de degrees. Um, and it's very much the, the burden falling on, on civilians. Um, but I think that research and data collection also speaks predominantly to the direct impacts. And in addition, important also to recognize that there are very severe uh, indirect and reverberating effects that often stem from damage and destruction to infrastructure. So for example, from uh, damage to housing, power networks, water and sanitation systems, that often can far outweigh in um, in terms of the impact it has on civilians, uh, the immediate death toll from, say, an individual uh, attack. Um, and these long-term impacts um, are experienced by people far beyond the area of the attack, but also for long periods of time, so for weeks, months, or even years after. Um, and I think we'll hear a bit more about this from other speakers, but um, as a couple of examples in, in Mosul, and I know Mohanad will speak to this shortly, 80% um, of the housing was destroyed, years on people are still displaced, um, and entire neighbourhoods are yet to be uh, rebuilt, which um, has had a, a significant impact as well on basic services and, and poor sanitation, which has um, led to severe uh, health problems. Similarly, in Raqqa, the water irrigation system was destroyed, 
um, which has impacted a, a wide proportion of the population there and outside of it. Um, so these, those are just a couple of examples. And I think that when you look at the full range of harms and the scope of the problem in different countries around the world, um, it underscores the importance of, of working to address this. We were very pleased to see the adoption of the political declaration last year. Um, and it's significant, I think, in our eyes because it is the first international recognition that the use of explosive weapons in populated areas is a humanitarian problem and that it needs to be addressed directly. Um, so I think identifying and recognizing it as a problem is, is very much the first step. Um, as others said, it was adopted and signed onto by 83 states a year ago. Um, and by agreeing and signing onto this declaration, it represents a major step forward. But I think also important to recognize that this is very much a starting point um, it, it's built on a recognition that we're now going to commit to work together to make changes in policy and in practice and help to set new standards that protect civilians and uh, addresses the humanitarian impacts of bombing and shelling in towns and cities. So in terms of what the declaration does and where we go from here, um, in broad terms, the declaration commits states to uh, make changes in policy and practice. Um, and recruit, most crucially, it imposes limits on use of explosive weapons in populated areas in order to avoid civilian harm. Specifically, it has a commitment requiring states to restrict or refrain from use and to do to make these changes through changes in policy and practice. It also requires militaries to limit damage to infrastructure, and that means developing better processes to understand the impact on civilian, prop on po civilian populations when infrastructure is damaged or destroyed. Um, and it requires states to provide assistance to victims and affected communities, including emergency medical care, psychological and trauma support, ongoing rehabilitation, um, and ensuring access to services. And then lastly, it requires states to gather and share data on civilian harm in military operations and, and recognizes the role of organizations in doing this. So I think very much the focus now from our perspective is for using this declaration as a tool to start to make changes. And but that means the states that have signed on to it need to start implementing it uh, to help set new standards of practice and behavior, but also working to bring other states on board it. Uh, thank you and back over to you, Dina. Thank you, Laura. Um, I would like now to turn to Irini Yordiu who's um, legal advisor in ICRC's Arms um, and Conduct of Hostilities Unit in Geneva. Irini, um, last year, ICRC published um, a very timely report entitled Explosive Weapons with Wide Area Effects, a Deadly Choice in Populated Areas. Could you tell us in a nutshell what um, the study revealed? Over to you, Irini. Thanks a lot, uh, Dina, and thanks for inviting me on this panel. So I had the chance to work on this report, uh, but first I want to say that it's the result of many, many years of work of many ICRC colleagues, both here at headquarters in Geneva, but also in many parts of the world in contexts where armed conflict is taking place in cities and other populated areas or in the aftermath, uh, because the effects of heavy explosive weapons don't necessarily stop when the conflict is over. And through about a decade or over a decade of working in such contexts, we have realized that the use of heavy explosive weapons in populated areas is a major cause of civilian harm. And at the same time, it has serious implications under international law. So before I share the main findings of this report, I just wanted to say a few words about what the purpose of our work was and how we went about collecting the evidence and, and putting our conclusions on paper um, in this 153-page long report. Um, since 2011, we have been calling on states and all parties to armed conflict to avoid the use of explosive weapons with wide area effects in populated areas. This means we are asking them 
not to use such weapons in populated areas unless they can take sufficient mitigation measures to limit their wide area effects and consequently the risk of civilian harm. So in 2014, we launched a multidisciplinary initiative to better document the civilian harm, the different types, direct, indirect, um, that others already mentioned, types of harm caused by these weapons to identify the weapons that have the most problematic uh, technical characteristics when used in populated areas to analyze the legal problems that arise uh, from their use, and also to compile examples of existing doctrine and practice among the armed forces on restrictions and limitations. And we did this through expert meetings, through dialogue uh, with armed forces, with some non-state armed groups, and of course, um, our protection work in affected contexts and uh, legal analysis. And we did all this with uh, a very simple objective, which was really to influence the behavior of parties to armed conflicts towards better protecting civilians, but also better respecting international humanitarian law. And we think both of these can be achieved by, as I said, avoiding the use of heavy explosive weapons in populated areas. Essentially, all of this work aims at triggering a change in mindsets of militaries, but also their uh, civilian policy maker counterparts. So the report compiles our conclusions uh, from all these years of work and analysis, work in the field and analysis here in Geneva and also provides a list of detailed practical recommendations for political authorities uh, and armed forces of both states and non-state armed groups on measures that they can take and we think they should take to put a policy of avoiding the use of heavy explosive weapons in populated areas into action. So some of the key findings I would like to share with you first and it will come as no surprise, it has been mentioned by others. The report shows that although civilian harm is complex in urban warfare, it has many causes, a lot of it does come down to the choice and the manner of use of certain weapons and tactics. And here, uh, heavy explosive weapons, those that have effects over an area well, much larger than their target, prove to be particularly problematic. And we've seen in various contexts in different regions of the world, wherever these weapons are used to strike targets in places where civilians are concentrated, there is consistently a pattern of civilian harm, direct and indirect. I won't go through the different types of harm. Um, they've already been mentioned to some extent. I, I know we will hear also testimonies and uh, field experience on this. But uh, this harm, as I said, does not stop at the end of hostilities, especially when large scale critical infrastructure collapses, as we have seen, for example, in Syria, in Yemen, but elsewhere as well the population will suffer the lack of essential services for years after. Second finding is that um, the wide area effects of many explosive weapons, be it because they are just very powerful in explosive material or because they are not accurate and have a large margin of error, is inappropriate makes them inappropriate for use in populated areas and causes um, serious humanitarian, but also legal concern. So this is really the key characteristic here. We're not talking about any explosive weapon. We are talking about those that have wide area effects. The third finding is uh, that it's very difficult to use such weapons in populated areas in accordance with some key rules of international humanitarian law. And without going into a lot of legal detail, uh, I am mostly referring to 
the rule that prohibits indiscriminate attacks and the rule that requires uh, that every attack is um, proportionate. So the civilian harm expected is not excessive compared to the military advantage. And the wide area effect of these weapons, when they are used in an environment where civilians are mingled with, with military objectives, makes it very challenging. And in many cases, I would say, impossible to respect international humanitarian law when using them. The fourth finding has to do with uh, existing military policy and practice. So we concluded that there are examples of restrictions and limitations on the use of some heavy explosive weapons, but they are not generalized. Um, and I know OCHA has done a lot of work on collecting these as well. They are mission specific. Uh, they are insufficient. A lot more needs to be done uh, to change doctrine and practice in this respect. That's where the political declaration on EWIPA will hopefully make a good contribution. But these examples show that it is possible to restrict uh, heavy uh, explosive weapon use in a way that does not compromise the success of a military operation and that these restrictions can really go a long way in better protecting civilians. And so the ultimate finding, and with this I'll close, is that, uh, and this is the main conclusion of the report, if you want, avoiding as a matter of policy the use of heavy explosive weapons in populated areas is both necessary and possible. And uh, this is the purpose of the many recommendations that we provide at the end of this report on measures to be taken, some of them already in peacetime at a very high policy or strategic level and others at more operational and tactical level. Um, so many layers of measures, many different categories of measures that make avoiding the use of heavy explosive weapons possible. Uh, and ultimately, as I said, it is our uh, strong conviction that this will help not only better respect the law, which is, of course, very important, but ultimately better protect civilians uh, in those environments that are very difficult to operate uh, in. And that's, I think, the essential ultimate uh, purpose of all of our work. Thanks. Back to you. Thank you uh, for those reflections, Lilini. Um, both you and Laura, I think, have provided us with um, very rich remarks on the humanitarian consequences arising from the use of, uh, of OIPA, the significance of the political declaration, and also um, for me, a big takeaway um, from what you've outlined, Irini, is the recommendation for a policy of avoidance. Um, we'll now turn to some programming and country level perspectives. And my next question is to Rasmus um, Sanvol, um, Weschke, who's Senior Policy Advisor with the Norwegian People's Aid Department um, for Mine Action and Disarmament. Rasmus, I'm keen um, to hear from you on what the Norwegian People's Aid um, does in practice to empower civilians to be better prepared and protected against the use of OIPA, and what lessons can be drawn from your experience. So over to you, Rasmus. Thank you very much, Tina. And uh, thanks for this introduction and for inviting NPA to speak. Thanks also to the organizers and to previous speakers. Um, please allow me to emphasize one important point uh, about the political declaration. I think it can really make a positive impact on the ground, but only if properly implemented. And I guess the question to anyone who wants to see stronger protection of civilians is basically how do we achieve this? And there are several solutions and avenues one can pursue. And one uh, answer is obviously uh, strengthening IHL compliance and implementing political commitments on stronger protections on top of, of IHL and uh, continuously changing policies and practices in order to achieve better protection. When this works, it's indeed very, very efficient. And NPA is fully committed to help uh, implement this declaration. Uh, however, when bombs are falling uh, at the very moment, are there other activities that uh, can mitigate the humanitarian consequences of EWIPA use? Uh, 
Uh, other things one can do to prevent some of the harm they cause to civilians. Some um, smart colleagues of mine in MPA, they contemplated about uh, these questions a few years ago. And uh, as a mine action operator, NPA was very familiar with the concept of um, mine risk education, um, as we called it back then. And uh, these are activities aimed at uh, preventing harm to civilians from unexploded ordnance and, and landmines, basically. This is an activity that uh, takes place uh, usually post-conflict. It's very important work, but we all uh, knew back then, and we still know that most victims of explosive weapons uh, use, they occur during conflict. So uh, what could we do to reduce some of these casualties? Mm. We know also that other sectors like disaster risk reduction had this concept of preparedness as a well-established concept. And the idea basically being that prevention is better than cure. So whatever injury, be it physical or mental, we can help to prevent is good. And uh, we also knew that no such initiative of preparedness existed for armed conflict, at least not in our organization or uh, to our awareness. So this is basically how NPA started its uh, conflict preparedness and protection program, uh, CPP for short. And as this name hopefully indicates, it's an in initiative uh, aimed at improving people's protection from explosive weapons, mainly through preparedness. So. Um, um, <clears throat> the, the program is composed of uh, various methods to empower civilians with tools and knowledge they can use to better prepare themselves and protect themselves and their families from the consequences of a WIPA use. And often we get this question, can we anticipate conflict? Do we know where to implement and where a conflict will happen? Well, not really, but Let's take a place like uh, Gaza, which we uh, are very familiar with through watching the news uh, these days, uh, where conflict has been reoccurring for a long time. And in such a place, it definitely made sense to uh, prepare for the next escalation. And uh, the way we do this is uh, that we try to do as much outreach during periods of relative calm. So we raise awareness in the public using uh, anything from radio to social media, TV, we've been doing theater productions for children, music videos and rap videos and all those things. And we also conduct um, trainings, basically training sessions where uh, people can meet in a community center or any uh, useful location and receive training from uh, either partner staff or NPA staff on things they can do to improve their own protection uh, before the next ex escalation. And uh, so far we have trained a quarter of a million people, 250,000 people have received this training. Um, and it's kind of a way to combat apathy, you know, the sense of having no agency. And in a way I understand that it's really difficult work, but anything we can do to try to make people feel a bit more safe and ideally be more safe, uh, we uh, are trying to do. So in a place where armed conflict is, is uh, a, a recurring fact, we have learned to, to uh, recognize that it becomes a fact of life and almost a norm. And, and people have a tendency to unfortunately accept that this is the way it is. Yet there are many um, injuries, for example, uh, for example, to civilians uh, from secondary fragmentation that we feel could ideally have been prevented um, by taking some measures. Um, and of course we can't prevent every, everything, but uh, we will do as much as we can. And now during this escalation that we have observed since um, 8th uh, October, uh, of course we can't conduct any trainings on the ground. Uh, humanitarian access is non-existent and the humanitarian situation is extreme. Uh, however, what we have been able to do is to reach people via social media, for example. We have basic Facebook and Instagram accounts where we post um, different safety messages. Uh, and these uh, receive quite a lot of attention during times of escalation. They are widely shared and people do engage with them. So I think uh, 1.6 million uh, individual accounts have been reached 
on Facebook and Instagram the last uh, uh, couple of weeks, many of them within Gaza, because we try to do some targeted advertisement to reach the people we really want to um, talk to. And uh, I will put a link to an Instagram account in the chat box, so you can all have a look uh, about the uh, at the safety messages we we uh, post there. And uh, these messages are in Arabic, but uh, the translate function in in Facebook and, and Instagram is quite uh, quite good, so it should make some sense in English as well. And um, for those not speaking Arabic, of course. Um, what have we learned from uh, our lessons and these experiences? So obviously it's not a panacea. It's not something that will take away um, the consequences of, of the use of explosive weapons. Yet it can be impactful work. Um, we, we need to implement this where it makes sense. And we need to implement it in a way that makes sense for the conflict in question. And Another thing we have learned is uh, that working with local partners has been extremely efficient. Uh, people knowing the context, the language, the culture, and uh, what works in terms of um, conveying a message has been extremely efficient. We're also happy to see that uh, other organizations are picking up similar or, or, or the same initiative and uh, implementing it as well. So we are inviting everyone who feels motivated and feel like they can contribute to to also do such work. Um, to summarize, let me uh, just um, try to, to wrap up by saying how these CPP activities relate to Evipa. So we're trying to prevent uh, the use of certain weapons and, and uh, certain weapon use. So that's sort of the preventive aspect. We have to assume somehow that some use will continue. So that's when we are preparing. Uh, and then we are responding when it happens with uh, adapted messaging. I will end here. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, please don't hesitate to ask any questions. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Rasmus. Um, we'll now turn to a perspective from Yemen. My next question is to Lucy Boone, who heads up the Civilian Impact uh, Monitoring Project in, in Yemen. Lucy, um, could you offer an overview um, of the project um, in Yemen and share your insights on how the project, as well as the protection cluster more broadly, might influence national policies aimed um, at regulating and restricting the use of explosive weapons in this densely populated areas? And could you also perhaps speak to some of the challenges uh, encountered in this work? Over to you, Lucy. Thank you, Dina. Um, and I just wanted to start by thanking everyone involved in this event, you know, be, be you organising, speaking or listening. What a sadly well-timed and necessary discussion. I'm going to talk about the Civilian Impact Monitoring Project. Um, to give a quick overview, SIMP is an open source monitoring mechanism to record and analyse the trends in how armed violence is directly impacting civilians in Yemen, from casualties to property damage and infrastructural damage. Um, you can find more on our methodology in the list of resources that's been shared for this event. But in short, SIMP is our mechanism to monitor the trends in who is being impacted by armed violence, by what type of armed violence, where and how this is changing over time and by location. From the beginning, SIMP's main aim has been to inform programming, victim assistance and response in as close to real time as possible. But over time, we found SIMP is increasingly being used for advocacy. Um, so when it comes to influencing government policies, the analysis we're able to draw from our data really allows us to put together some, some really strong evidence-based messaging, um, which we then push out in the form of periodic and thematic reports. We also encourage partners across the humanitarian and diplomatic communities to pull on us to support their key advocacy lines in ad advance of meetings, uh, statements, and so on. I'll give two quick examples of this um, in Yemen specifically. So firstly, artillery fire near residential areas. And there has been an overall de-escalation in Yemen since a countrywide truce came into effect in April last year. And nonetheless, sporadic artillery fire continues in the frontline areas, including in close proximity to residential areas. Um, so since that truce commenced in April last year, Shellfire has been responsible for over 650 civilian casualties in Yemen, including two mass casualty shelling incidents in Thai's city. 
Pais, for those not familiar with Yemen, um, is the biggest city in the country through which active front lines run. It's densely populated, and I, I know this has already been uh, been touched on, but to put it as succinctly as possible, in densely populated environments, a higher number of civilians are likely to be within the blast radius when such incidents occur. So we often do see higher civilian casualties as a result. Um, so our hope is that with you know with, with the analysis and the, well, the trend analysis and the assessment lines that we put together, our hope is that INGOs and actors involved in ceasefire negotiations and mediations can use and and indeed have used our uh, uh, the key lines from our assessments to bolster their calls to the parties to exercise restraint to call for accountability and so on. Um, secondly, UXO a legacy threat from explosive weaponry that remains present and dangerous long after hostilities cease. Um, in Yemen, we see a particularly high proportion of children among UXO casualties, you know, likely driven by factors such as inquisitiveness, uh, lack of threat awareness, heightened mobility in areas off the beaten track, whether whilst playing or, or tending to livestock. Um, this year in Yemen, three in five UXO casualties has been a child. And what we can do at SIMP is use this data to identify where civilians, including children, are most frequently being impacted in order to assist organizations with targeted awareness messaging, such as what Rasmus was, was speaking about, um, and broader advocacy for clearance efforts, as well as feeding into that, that influence piece when it comes to governmental policies. Um, Dean, you've asked me to highlight some of the challenges we face. Uh, there are plenty, but I'll draw out four here. Firstly, it's sensitivities around the topic. Um, monitoring how different armed groups may or may not be violating IHL is a highly sensitive area, and one we have to navigate so carefully without jeopardizing the integrity of our work. Um, we manage this in a number of ways. Firstly, we, um, this is specifically for the Civilian Impact Monitoring product, Project. We do not name perpet perpetrators, nor do we make the judgment around what is an IHL violation or not. We are simply collating the reports of what has happened. IHL experts are then able to use our data, and they do use our data as a starting point for more rigorous investigations. Um, but in not naming the perpetrators ourselves, we're not directly engaged in accountability. And that allows us to take a more objective stance in our reports, because actually, um, it creates a bit of a safety net for our staff as well. Also, we don't carry out independent verification of each incident. We're not carrying out further investigations in the field. We don't have a network on the ground um, who sort of, of informants, so to speak, who are confirming or denying incidents. It, it, in the Yemen context, it probably wouldn't be feasible, and it can be just as corruptible, if not more corruptible, than open sources. So SIMP is a strictly open source project. Um, this can put some organizations off due to concerns over credibility, so all we can do is be as transparent about our methodology as possible. Um, big challenge number two is that the information landscape in Yemen is extremely limited. Um, infrastructure is, is a challenge across the country, and, and the, the, the media landscape as a result is, is also challenging. Unlike some casualty monitoring mechanisms, we don't require a minimum number of sources or a minimum number of types of sources. Um, as just too many incidents wouldn't make it through that threshold into our data set. So this means that we're doing our best not to discriminate against remote areas where reporting options are limited. Um, if information is limited, so long as it meets our criteria for credibility, it goes into our data set. Um, and sometimes as more reporting and information becomes available, we can go back into the database and update it accordingly. So that we can try to keep it organic in that sense. Um, no number is fixed as such. Challenge three, um, conflicting information on account of biases in reporting. And this is an issue that is by no means isolated to Yemen. Uh, this is where our team comes in. Most have been working in the Yemen analytical space for near on a decade. So they understand the nature of the reporting, different groups' agendas, and how this plays into the inherent biases in the reporting. So we, we may be faced with uh, reports with widely varying casualty numbers or disputes over the type of armed violence that was responsible. Our research team are excellent at going into that data with their contextual understanding of the situation and their familiarity with the nature of the sources to discern the most likely version of the truth, you know, cross-referencing, corroborating as they go. Fourth and final challenge um, is timeliness. So what do I mean by this? SIMP 
was established in 2018. That's three years after the current conflict commenced. Um, we know that the initial years of the conflict saw some of the fiercest hostilities, and typically it's in that early tumult of war that civilian loss is at its highest. Dynamic front lines and before accountability mechanisms have really become established. We have a three-year data gap during this time in Yemen. Establishing monitoring mechanisms at the soonest opportunity is crucial to fully capture the impact on civilians and thus provide concrete figures for policy makers and decision makers. Um, you can find a range of our reports on the website. I've included one of them in the uh, this event's resource list um, that addresses different threat profiles across different cities in Yemen. But please do feel free to reach out to me um, directly or, or through the Q&A here for any further questions. That's all for me. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Lucy. I think, again, um, a lot of lessons learned and um, to draw from the model in, in Yemen and also from what you shared, Rasmus. Um, I will now turn um, to Mr. Mohanad uh, Abdul Salam, um, our last but certainly not least panel speaker. Uh, Mohanad will share a perspective from Iraq where he's a lawyer advocating for the rights um, of people with disabilities and internally displaced persons. Mohanad, um, you were uh, one of the speakers during last year's Protection of Civilians Week. Um, and at that event, you advocated for the adoption of instruments and mechanisms to enhance the protection of civilians um, from the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. After having um, experienced this firsthand yourself, um, your family, and your community in your hometown in Hamdaneya, Mosul, um, in Iraq. Um, now, one year after the adoption of the AWIPA political declaration, um, my question to you is what are your reflections on this significant milestone? And what are your expectations uh, for the future of this political declaration? Over to you, Mohanad. Shukran, Dina. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dina, uh, and thank you for Huda, and th thank you for all the distinguished guests and uh, organizers. Uh, organizers. My name is uh, Muhammad Abdul Salam. Uh, I have a degree in law. Huda, uh, uh, is my voice clear? Uh, yes, clear. Uh, I am from Mosul uh, and I have been uh, among the طويلة. displaced uh, people for a long time. Uh, I am also among the survivors uh, uh, from the war that broke out in my city in 2014. In May uh, last year, I was one of the speakers in the urban warfare and displacement event during the Secretary General Protection uh, of Civilians uh, Week. And I remember retelling my story uh, again. And I retelling my story uh, today. Sharing the sad memories of me, my family, and my neighbors having to flee our houses after the invasion of ISIS. We, uh, our homes were used by ISIS as uh, shelters and military bases during their battles. My family and I were among thousands of families who were forced uh, to display several times from 2014 until 2016. 
اثناء تعرض قريتي ومدينتي للقصف الجوي الذي تنظيم داعش لقد كنت محظوظا بما يكفي للنجاة من الحرب لكن كانت الثمن باهظا للغاية العيش مع صدمة أحاول التغلب عليها Recover from and an amputated leg and a body full of wounds. في العام الماضي خلال حماية المدنيين uh, كنت آمل أن يتم الاستماع إلى ندائي الدول باسم الإنسانية لوقف استخدام الأسلحة الفتاكة ثم شعرت بسعادة غامرة عندما علمت باعتماد عدة دول الإعلامية في تعزيز حماية المدنيين الإنسانية والناجمة عن استخدام الأسلحة المتطرفة من المقبولة على الرغم من أنني متفائل بطبعي إلا أن صور المدنيين الأبرياء الذين قتلوا على نطاق واسع على في هذا العام بأسلحة متطورة ومتطورة في مناطق مكتظة بالسكان وتكاثر الصراعات في عدة أجزاء من العالم عادتني إلى الوراء إلى الصدمة وإلى الشعور اللاإرادي بالخوف من المستقبل والخوف من أن تعود الحرب وأن تأكل الأخضر واليابس وأن يتكرر السيناريو المأساة التي مررنا بها أنا وأهلي في الماضي وجيران أتمنى أن يتوقف هذا الكابوس أتمنى أن تنتهي الدموية أن, أن يحصل الأطفال على حياة التي يستحقونها أن لا تتفرق العائلات أبدا أن تتفرق العائلات حقوق كل إنسان مما كان دينه وعرفه واختلافه الجسدي والفكري ما زلت أحلم بحياة أفضل ما زلت أتمنى كما ترى لقد استمعت بعناية للمداخلات السابقة وقلت لنفسي لطالما لا تزال هناك وكالات وأشخاص يتمون بإخلاص فقد نجد طريقا للنجاة وما دمت وما دامت بعد الدول لا تزال مهتمة فقد نجد نورا في نهاية النفق وأمل أن يترجم هذا الإعلان السياسي إلى أفعال وأمل أن تحترم الدول القانون للإنسان الدولي وقانون حقوق الإنسان أمل أن نلتقي في العام المقبل مرة أخرى I hope that we meet next year, but to celebrate peace. And I hope that the international community realize that we live together in this world. And we have a duty to protect it. If it is not for our sakes, it is for the sake of future generation, for the sakes of your children and our وأن يحقق الإعلان السياسي شكرا للجميع لاستماعي أي شخص يريد السؤال شكرا دينا شكرا مهند Thank you. Uh, for the reflections. Uh, shukran. Uh, yes, sorry, I was hearing the, the double um, translation as well. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mohamed. Um, I um, and my personal thanks to the whole panel for your active uh, participation and thoughtful responses. Um, it's been a very valuable um, debate and I think has outlined a number of important lessons learned and, and ideas as well as um, 
the accountability um, uh, question overall, I think, um, and the need um, for um, uh, prevention. Um, I think um, we will now, I don't want to take more time, I think uh, I will hand over to Huda Shashul, who will now pose to the panel some of the questions that have come through in the chat. So um, because we have not much time left, um, I will hand over uh, to Huda now. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. Thank you to all the speakers. And thank you, Mohanad, for this uh, moving uh, testimony. So uh, I will. Uh, I think we received uh, quite a number of uh, questions, but I will start uh, maybe with the first question from DRC, and I will address it to Lucy, um, or, or maybe first Irini, ICRC, sorry, because it's a question about the civilian character, and I know how much ICRC is, is working on this, and we, we have with the UNSCR and the ICRC an ed memoir about the civilian character of uh, sites and settlements, etc. So the question was uh, posed in French, but I would read it in French and then in English. Uh, so... Um, Question from DRC, que devons-nous faire en tant qu'acteurs humanitaires lorsque les camps militaires sont... What do we do as humanitarian actors when these camps are built very close to the general population and when we see the use of um, explosive weapons that can harm civilians? This, this is the experience in the DRC in many areas. Uh, what should uh, the humanitarian actors do when military camps are built near to the civilians uh, civilian homes and sites, and when we observe explosive ordnance that can harm civilians. Over to you, Irini. Thanks a lot uh, for the question. So it has two parts. One is about situating the military camps close to uh, civilian objects, in this case, houses. And the second is about uh, explosive devices or ordnance. So, as regards the first part, there is uh, an obligation under IHL to um, the so-called passive uh, precautions to protect civilians against the effects of attack. So to the maximum extent possible, avoid placing military objectives close to civilians and civilian objects. And a military camp is something that is clearly a military objective when there is an armed conflict because of its character. So already in peacetime, states or non-state armed groups, if it's a non-state armed group camp, have an obligation to avoid doing that, to, to uh, locate their forces, be it a military camp, be it a command headquarter, be it barracks or even officers' uh, academies, away from civilians. Now, unfortunately, we see in many parts of the world, including in Switzerland, where I am based, uh, especially with urbanization, many of these structures are in the middle of cities. Um, and although technically this is a violation of the law, practically nobody will say to the Swiss government, OK, move your military barracks away from um, Zurich or Bern city center and out into the countryside. Although technically that would be the correct thing to do. Now, this is in peacetime. If a country is in armed conflict or in a situation of violence that risks amounting, that risks uh, escalating into an armed conflict, then there is much higher responsibility to move those um, facilities away from the civilian population. And if that's not possible, then at least to move the civilian population further away from the military objectives, but preferably the first rather than the second to avoid displacing civilians unless this is absolutely necessary. So this is an obligation. Um, and if it's not possible at all, then to take other precautionary measures to protect civilians against attacks. But the best thing would be to move these military camps away. Again, there is more leeway if we are in peacetime, but much stronger duty when we are in a context of violence or, or even more armed conflict. On explosive ordnance, there is also uh, clear obligations under IHL to uh, take measures to protect civilians, including 
okay, first of all, clearing and removing them, but until that's possible, marking the areas that are contaminated so that civilians can see the signs and not approach, and also give uh, risk education to civilians to recognize these dangerous um, objects and avoid touching them. And this is something we work also with uh, local authorities a lot on to help them build capacity and um, design and and um, implement this kind of risk awareness, safe behavior, as they're called, um, programs for the civilian population to sensitize them to the risk and uh, avoid that they are exposed as much as possible. But of course, the best way to protect them is by removing and clearing these um, these uh, ordnance uh, or landmines or um, other explosive devices. And I know many NGOs also work um, in this field as well. Thank you very much, Irini. I don't know if Rasmus, Lucy, or Laura, will, would you like to add anything? Otherwise, there is another question. Uh, that is uh, connected to this, actually. Uh, the second question is about the, the, the combination, in combination with the explosive ordnance risk education that NGOs are conducting, how possible is it to train armed groups, armies, on international humanitarian law, its principles, and its applicability? I don't know if uh, ICRC would like to comment on this the to complement the EORE explosive ordnance risk education part and then maybe we will hear uh, from uh, Rasmus, Laura and Lucy some examples uh, from the field. Over to you. Um, sure, I'll take this and then I will stop to let others speak as well. So yes, it's certainly possible. Uh, IHL education courses is something we do regularly, mostly for state forces officers, uh, trainings in peacetime, but also pre-deployment before they are deployed in operations and explosive ordnance and protecting civilians from um, explosive ordnance is part of those. Uh, we do it to some extent also with some non-state armed groups, depending on the level of uh, kind of relationship and dialogue we have with them. But I think knowledge of the law and teaching what the law says is not enough. Um, it, it has to be complemented by training armed forces in how to implement the law. And how they implement the law is usually by means of doctrine and policy and uh, practical measures. So that's where the recommendations in our report, the commitments in the political declaration come in as well. So training on those aspects is also very important. Of course, uh, the more, the better they know international humanitarian law, the more uh, chances of, the more cases of violation of the law and, and civilian harm will be avoided. Because in many cases, if we talk about heavy explosive weapons, if the law is properly interpreted and implemented, in many cases, the use of these weapons will be considered unlawful. And so hopefully parties to conflict won't uh, do it. So both knowledge, but also application. Then a very last point uh, I wanted to make is when, especially about non-state armed groups, but also for military state forces to some extent, it's not exclusively about the law. Uh, um, many times the behavior of these uh, forces is influenced also by other factors, be it cultural or religious or ethical factors, and this we should not ignore. They don't do things only because the law says. Often it's these other factors, even the culture in the armed forces themselves, how they are, uh, how, how, the, um, how the peer pressure and yes, the culture, the tradition works, influence how they behave. This was the conclusion of a long study we made a few years ago called Roots of Restraint. What factors restrain parties to conflict from violating uh, the law or human rights? Um, so we have to, in our trainings, also tap into these other uh, principles as well that are complementary to the law. <laughs> 
Thank you very much. Please feel free uh, uh, to to compliment. I don't know if uh, Rasmus, you would like to to add anything. Uh, yeah, let me add something really quickly. Um, ICRC is doing a, a tremendous job uh, everywhere in the world to teach IHL to um, to relevant uh, stakeholders, be them um, non-state arm groups or states. Just would uh, would like to add that when implementing the political declaration. We're also discussing how states interpret their obligations and what policies they have and what practices they have when it comes to the conduct of hostilities or military planning, et cetera, et cetera. So it's in this dialogue with states that um, both uh, civil society, uh, other agencies, uh, ICRC and others uh, are involved in that we may um, be able to change practices, policies uh, when we go on to implement this political declaration that we've been discussing today. And I see the question starts with uh, the uh, NICE abbreviation, EORE, Explosive Ordnance Risk Education. Um, let me just add quickly that this is, uh, uh, yeah, these are activities done to try to teach uh, civilians how to prevent harm to themselves, but mostly um, on unexploded ordnance mines, unexploded bombs. And when explosive weapons are used in cities and populated areas, clearing these um, these uh, these ordnance and these devices is much more complicated than when uh, a minefield or an explosive ordnance is situated in an open area far away from civilians and far away from civilian objects. So. We as a mine action organization also see that when uh, wars and conflicts move to cities, also the post-conflict clearance work becomes much more complicated. It takes more time, uh, it's uh, it's dangerous, and it's much more complex. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, I think that uh, there is a question addressed to Laura about uh, the pattern of harm, I think you mentioned that, Laura, in your uh, presentation. So what is the importance of establishing a pattern of harm? What is the added value of establishing such a pattern in political, legal, military terms? Over to you. Thanks, Huda, and thanks for the question. Um, I think this speaks to um, the question of how and our, our strategy for approaching this as a problem, which um, in part is how the, the the issue of explosive weapons in populated areas is is framed. Um, and I think that is important because the how the issue and the problem is understood obviously uh, has a bearing on on the actions that are needed to effectively um, address it. Um, so from our perspective, I think recognizing that use of explosive weapons in populated areas is a pattern of harm has been very important for developing the response to it. Um, and so through the research and data that has been done, done by civil society organizations, you know, as I said in my presentation, this shows that this is a problem uh, that is uh, experienced across lots of different countries in the world. And I think um, shows the need for this uh, to be seen very much as a, a global problem, um, a pattern that um, that is experienced in, in different countries whenever explosive weapons are used in populated areas. Um, so through the data, I think we found also that the impacts have been documented regardless of the armed actor. Um, so whenever explosive weapons are used, it is causing similar patterns of harm in different countries. And I think this is also even the case when states or parties to conflict are claiming to act in accordance with international humanitarian law. Um, so I think it speaks a bit to what Irene was explaining before and, and Rasmus there now that um, obviously, upholding international humanitarian law is very important, but it also starts to get to a, a level of detail um, below the law, so to say, in terms of how the effects of weapons are understood and how that's factored into um, the conduct of military operations and decisions that armed forces are making. And I think that speaks to um, some of the particular uh, commitments in the declaration around um understandings needed uh, to, to be uh, put into place on when explosive weapons are used and more importantly, restrictions and when refraint um, is needed there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura.
there is another question uh, to Mohanad. I guess uh, Mohanad uh, will get access to the translation. Otherwise, Mohanad, uh, do you hear the translation? Okay. So, uh, the person who posted this question, thank you first for your moving testimony. Then uh, he or she mentioned that you were talking about the psych psychological effects on civilians affected by military attacks. Uh, and he or she asked, what would be your recommendations to the humanitarian organization in terms of aligning protection of civilian in, uh, with mental health and psychosocial support? I'm waiting for the... No. Okay, uh, of course, uh, we need uh, to take into consideration the victims uh, and traumatized uh, victims uh, who they live in this uh, trauma. Uh, as my experience, um, I still feel uh, the trauma when I see the wars, uh, the conflicts. Uh, I remember my experience and I remember all the details, the details of the war. Uh, of course, my mental health uh, is affected uh, and I feel down. Uh, my uh, mental health really uh, get affected uh, by these images and I stop watching the news. So the organization needs to take care of these people, uh, especially those victims. And uh, uh, traumatized people need to be taken care of by the organizations uh, and they should pay a, a big deal of attention to those people. Thank you. Thank you. Shukran, Shukran. Thank you. Uh, any reaction from uh, the, the speakers from Lucy, uh, for example, in Yemen on mental health, psychosocial support? Uh, do you see that uh, um, uh, properly covered by by the humanitarian actors uh, in Yemen, for example? And uh, the question is also open to to all the the speakers. Over to you. Thanks, Huda. It's uh, it's it's difficult to comment on on the extent to which it is addressed by humanitarian actors, but I mean it's certainly. It's certainly something that is constantly discussed and flagged, you know, even in the civilian impact monitoring project, we, we have a, a category for psychosocial trauma. So for every single instance of armed violence that gets reported to have impacted civilians, we, we have an assessment in there in terms of the likely sort of secondary impacts such as psychosocial uh, trauma. And frankly, it's, it's, it's all of them. I mean, it's I don't. It's it's one of these things. It's it's very difficult. There are access challenges, um, but it's certainly on the radar. And I think then actioning it is 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 the real challenge. I see uh, Laura unmuted herself, so maybe you would like to add something. Oh, sorry, no, that was uh, okay. not intentional. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think uh, uh, an additional question was just added, so I will open the uh, Q&A here. And um, yes, there is a, a comment on non-state armed groups attack civilians and steal food and other material, including money. How do we protect them, I guess, uh, them, the civilians, in this kind of difficult situation, situation where civilians are attacked by non-state armed groups? It's a general question. Uh, maybe Irini, since we are talking about non-state armed groups, sorry for putting you. <laughs> I mean, um... It's, I don't think it's for us to say, uh, and it's not for us, us, I mean, at ICRC or humanitarian organizations to protect. Uh, every state has a primary responsibility to protect people on their territory. So that includes protecting them against criminal acts. And if we are talking about the acts that the um, 
that the uh, question describes, stealing food, uh, money, other material. These are all things prohibited, of course, under international humanitarian law, but also things that should be criminalized under domestic law, right? They are crimes. They are not uh, lawful behavior in, in warfare. So the state has the primary responsibility to protect people from anyone committing those acts, whether they are individual criminals or criminal gangs or organized groups engaging in criminal activity. This we have to, to distinguish from an armed group fighting um, the same way state armed forces fight and the right they have to conduct uh, hostilities under the law of armed conflict. Now, of course, we can uh, talk to them, and we do, and uh, explain that these things, pillage, destruction of civilian property, these are the technical terms used, are all prohibited under the law of armed conflict. And yes, uh, teaching about the law and all those other principles and values that I mentioned before that sometimes are even more influential on the behavior of some of these groups, cultural, religious, ethical, moral aspects, even customs, tapping into these and teaching about them and influencing them can to some extent protect civilians against this kind of behavior. But uh, we are not a peacekeeping force, obviously, so we cannot uh, actively protect against this kind of um, behavior. Respecting the law can go a long way to as I mentioned, prevent this type of unlawful conduct. But I wanted to go back to my very first point that the principal responsibility is with the state um, that has jurisdiction over the territory to protect civilians and including to protect civilians when they fight against these armed groups. So it's not that because they want to stop the criminal activity or unlawful activity of an armed group, they can disregard the protection of civilians uh, while conducting those operations. So it goes both ways, uh, if that makes sense. Thank you. A last question, I think. It's, a, uh, it's about Eripa declaration, explosive of weapons in populated areas. A, a, a declaration and the question is open and uh, this is what uh, the, this side event is, uh, is about. What is next? One word per speaker, if you want to, to highlight one next step for you, the immediate step that needs to be taken after the declaration. Laura? Thanks, Huda. I mean, I think implementation of its commitments, this is going to be the most effective way to bring about change. And we have a conference reviewing implementation in April next year. so starting work to be able to report on implementation changes by the time of that meeting, which is in April. Maybe Irini? Uh, what comes next? I would say having, keeping the momentum around this, uh, because these things tend to be forgotten after big events like the conference in Dublin last year. We have 83 states endorsing the declaration. It's a great number but no new endorsements since, and it's been almost a year. So I think we have to keep working and states as well to encourage other states to join the declaration so that the momentum is kept and this is not forgotten because just uh, endorsing this important instrument in itself is not enough. Uh, we need to keep the interest, we need to keep the attention of states so that they are um, also pushed to actually work to put it into practice. Thank you. Rasmus, over to you. Yeah, let me echo uh, some of that. I mean, what you guys were saying basically to me uh, sounds like translating the words into actions, right? And keeping the momentum also uh, involves universalization of this um, declaration. We can have many more signatures and we invite all states to endorse the declaration and of course immediately start implementation i mean that's what's going to make um the difference on the ground so we're not seeking just to have the text we're seeking to change behavior and to see better protection of civilians 
And there are many st steps that state can take. Uh, states can take immediately. They can assign a focal point in their uh, government to follow this up. They can start reviewing their uh, weapons and understand better how they function, especially when used in a populated area. And they can start looking at uh, their policies and their practices on, on such use and see if there are things they can do to prevent harm to civilians. And this is an ongoing effort. We do not expect this to be done by Oslo, we, but we expect states to start immediately um, on this work. Thank you very much. I think uh, Lucy will be uh, the last speaker. Mohanad said goodbye because he had to leave uh, for uh, urgent family matters. So Lucy, uh, over to you. Thanks. I mean, it sounds like fantastic progress has already been made. So it's, it's sort of echoing previous colleagues on maintaining momentum and, and seeing it through to the next stage of implementation. I think alongside that, it's important to raise awareness of the declaration's existence and how that sits along IHL. And there are sadly plenty of um, plenty of situations unfolding across the world that form a an important hook for this to be to be demonstrated through. Um, and then you know in, in, in time also then raising raising pressure on nations to sign and implement the declaration themselves and then translating that into actual, you know, like uh, like Rasmus was saying, not just words but actions. Thank you very much. I think uh, we reached the end of uh, our uh, side event. Uh, we received, we still received question, and I will share with the uh, with the speakers, and we can follow up uh, later with uh, those who asked this question. Uh, thanks very much, and I hope that uh, we will see implementation, we will see action, and uh, next year will be in a better place despite all the difficulties uh, we are we are. Uh, witnessing this time. So thank you very much and bye-bye uh, everyone.